and time back in. Okay. Uh, and myself, I'm Rob Glazer. Uh, Barbie and I both started with Pike Corps uh, pretty much when the company had started about 27 years ago. And, uh, yeah, right. <laughs> Barbie was 10. And, uh, I, I've been in real estate for about 33 years in Tucson, about eight years I did residential real estate, the first eight years, and then I started doing more commercial real estate work, and uh, I wanted an environment that, that was solely committed to uh, commercial real estate opposed to the kind of hybrid that I had before. And um, I met Mike Hammond, who was the founder of the company, and Originally, Picor was started as an industrial real estate company. Matter of fact, uh, the building that, uh, that you're in here and the, where the Calvary uh, Chapel is is one of the earliest projects we ever worked on. The first lease that I ever did was in that, that building 27 years ago. One of the early leases happened to be to, uh, uh, to Calvary uh, Chapel, the, the church. And there weren't many churches going into that kind of space at the time, but they did. And so, uh, now uh, Barbie and I are both principals in the company, and, you know, today I, I prefer, you know, your questions at any time. I want to give you content or information that will be interesting to you. And so, I'm, you know, I'm going to start with what I know, uh, but I know the commercial real estate, you know, uh, business in Tucson very well, and uh, personally I specialize in industrial real estate, uh, which is a little, you know, when we speak about commercial real estate, generally it's the umbrella that will cover, you know, shopping centers, medical centers, uh, business parks, uh, office. Raytheon office buildings, apartment buildings, that's the commercial real estate world. Uh, my specialty in the past 27 years has been leasing and selling industrial real estate. So this would be industrial here? Kind of like uh, this originally had been a uh, factory outlet mall uh, for Vanity Fair. So originally was a retail building. And now it has morphed as we see buildings at any given time in there history of going from maybe old warehouses to law offices, you know, we see some of that downtown, a lot of interesting space that at one time may have been a moving and storage company being converted now to galleries, but this building now, I would consider more of an industrial type building. But just to kind of add to that, industrial space kind of covers everything from the down and dirty manufacturing kind of space all the way through, you know, business parks where you've maybe got a combination of office and retail, office and warehouse, uh, through more high-tech R&D kind of space, which is really kind of classified as industrial also. Yeah, there's certainly uh, uh, many, any number of technology companies, optics companies, uh, medical, uh, medical software, uh, medical product development, you know, or the higher end uses that you'll find in business park space, the University Science and Tech Park, you know, we consider that industrial type space, although it's really much more, you know, R&D type space. We represent, you know, Raytheon, which are, you know, was a full gamut of, from warehousing to production to, you know, engineering and software development to who knows what else they do out there. Uh, and so that's, uh, my specialty is industrial type real estate. Um, so that's a little bit about who we are. I'm curious and I'm thinking because you're in this environment, do any of you lease space per se? Uh, okay. So, you know, used to, yeah, I, I would imagine, you know, in this kind of environment here, you know, this sort of collaboration, you know, that there's not a need, you know, until you end up with lots of product or, you know, product or employees or something like that. But I'll 
kind of give you a sense of, you know, what's going on in the commercial real estate industry, uh, specific to industrial, but again, if you have any questions about anything else, I'm happy to talk about it. Uh, and it's been very dynamic over the last uh, several years in, in a very mostly negative way, and it doesn't, and it really depends on you know, if you are a consumer of it or an owner of it, you know, if you're a consumer of it, it's been a very opportunistic time uh, because the value, uh, whether, you know, it be rents or actual ownership of buildings, you know, like this or the buildings I sold, the buildings, all those buildings to the west last year uh, where Lazy Days is, uh, values have come down considerably, 30, 40 percent, and have created all sorts of dynamics and issues, problems, and opportunities. Uh, but I think from any just individual or company standpoint, uh, when you think about, you know, commercial real estate, or is it something I need for my company, myself, uh, I think the fundamental consideration is how you want to deploy your capital. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, your dough, your money, your hard-earned money. Uh, you know, so I'll, I'll talk about the lease market, I'll talk about the sale market, some of the fundamentals that are going on, and then I'll talk about some of those considerations anyone might think of when they're leasing or they're buying, uh, you know, going through that decision. Uh, you know, basically in Tucson there's about 42 million square feet of industrial real estate. You know, this building here I think is about 120,000 square feet. So there's a fair amount of, you know, industrial real estate in Tucson, about 42 million. About half of that is available or is, le is lease space. The other half is owned. Um, in the lease market, there's about 3 million square feet vacant at this time. Uh, it's about, generally about 85% occupied, 15% vacant, about 3 million square feet that's available. That's not as vacant as the market has been in the past. In the mid-80s, when there were a considerable amount of new construction, mostly fueled by another kind of financial debacle in the early 80s, uh, but it was much more concentrated in some of the states in the West, you know, uh, Arizona, Colorado, California, uh, not even Nevada that much, uh, <coughs> Texas. In Florida, where the savings and loans existed, there was a considerable amount of money deployed into commercial real estate, a lot of buildings built, and a tremendous amount of vacancy. When I started in, in, uh, with PICOR, market vacancy was about 40-45%, and there was a lot of trouble then, but it was pretty concentrated to those markets, not, not the world problems that we have today. And uh, now there's about 3 million square feet vacant, uh, about 15% of vacancy. And in that, uh, what happens is that there is, it, there becomes a very good opportunity for tenants, uh, whether it be new business, existing business growing, or even existing business consolidating. There are very good opportunities because rents have come down about 30%. And uh, there's a number of things that landlords are wanting to do to compete to win a tenant's business to get that tenant into their, into their property. Uh, a balanced market where the landlord and the tenant are kind of on an even playing field uh, is when the market's about 92% occupied, which is when the market is about half as vacant as it is now, about 1.6 million square feet vacant. 
So that means about a million four hundred thousand square feet has to be absorbed before that market starts to shift from tenant having a good opportunity to lease to a landlord dictating what the terms are going to be and not not as competitive environment anymore. And in Tucson, generally, you know, if we absorb in a pretty healthy market, we'll absorb anywhere from about 400,000 to 600,000 square feet per year. Uh, in, from about 08 through 09, there was a reduction about 1.8 million square feet in consolidation of companies going out of business, uh, companies leaving the market. Um, maybe any one of you may have worked at one of those companies at one time. Uh, but there was a consolidation of the uh, you know, business, business market and uh, what created all this vacancy. And so the market now is, you know, moving at about, say, you know, if I were to predict on what uh, 2012 will be, I'd say it's probably 250,000 square feet of absorption. So, still not quite healthy, but it's moving in the right direction of, you know, business growth, but, you know, still slowly, you know, kind of consistent with the general economic climate. Um, so what I anticipate happening at a clip of about 400,000 square feet, we may achieve a balanced market in about three and a half years. You know, saying that, it rarely moves in a linear direction that is anywhere near predictable as, you know, we see the threats you know, worldwide to our, you know, to the U.S. economy and, and threats within the community and uh, how uh, politics could affect uh, employers, you know, for instance, you know, Raytheon, you know, if defense spending, be, you know, gets significantly reduced and Raytheon starts reducing their workforce, it could happen, it may, it may not happen may go in the other direction, you know, we just don't, we really, you know, don't know, but all those factors will uh, influence what the absorption will be in the Tucson marketplace. But I anticipate over about a three and a half year period the market being more balanced. And, uh, well, yeah. So, to the average person, why is it important to have a health Maybe not a business owner, but in the workforce or... You know, Barbie, I don't think it's... Uh, I think generally when there's a healthy real estate market, it is a reflection of the economy. You know, businesses are expanding to Job a degree. Yeah. Uh, the unemployment is down. Wages are probably going up. Uh, innovation is... Is grabbing hold and moving forward. Um, and yeah. So that's what I would say, you know, uh, generally a healthy commercial real estate market represents, uh, uh, is a, it's a product of all those things occurring. Uh, but if you're a tenant, uh, it probably means your business has been improving. Mm -hmm. And so you're going to pay more rent, but right. you probably can pay more rent business has improved. You know, what's the lease market generally look like? Did you have a question? Yeah, you just said, um, you know, it's on like the filling up trend, occupying spaces. Is there a certain sector that's actually, that you can attribute to that? Like, this industrial space is getting now leased <coughs> by whom? By what well, sector? yeah, that, that's, that's <coughs> something that we think about, you know, all the time, trying to identify, you know, where it is doing well. And it's small business is coming back. It took, in the latter part of the recession, I think the small business took the biggest hit. 
uh, as things kind of worked its way down the, uh, uh, you know, the ladder, small business was really affected. But now small business is, is, is coming back. So, you know, space generally under 5,000 square feet is fairly vacant. Uh, I mean, is fairly active, sorry, mm -hmm. you know, absorbing. Um, but, but there aren't too many 120,000 square feet deals? No, there are not. Okay. Uh, it's improved. Mm -hmm. You know, I would say 08, 09, even half of 2010, there were none. And we and, kind of tracked, like, how many buildings over 100,000 square feet opened up in the last, what, 18 months or so? Yeah, it was interesting. In, in 07, there was maybe one or two buildings left over 50,000 square feet that were available. There was a company, matter of fact, not that far from here, out in the airport area, Solon, a solar company, a German solar company, came in and, and leased 100,000 square feet, paid a very high rate for it, on a building that had been vacant for over 10 years. Wow. You know, so there really was nothing available. Now, you know, without counting, there's about 13 to 15 buildings wow. now available over 50,000 square feet. And for that period 08 to half of 2010, there was no activity in that, in that size range. And in a healthy year in Tucson, you'll have two or three transactions like that. Mm -hmm. We are starting to see some activity now in the last six months of bigger buildings over 50,000 square feet that are seeing activity. Uh, Zygo, a company out in the airport area, this type of optics, uh, you know, work, they're expanding from 25,000 square feet and recently bought a 100,000 square foot building. The American Airlines building that was on Valencia, that was, uh, I think it's about 85,000 square feet. It was a call center. It came available through the bankruptcy. And it has quite a number of prospects that are very serious about it. And so that market is improving. And that just kind of bodes well for the national economy because, you know, they're usually not local to Tucson growing, but, you know, some. Uh, outside company that you know wants to take advantage of what is available in Tucson. Mm -hmm. uh, rarely is it just the space alone; it's the type of employees, or the type of technology, uh, the type of uh, infrastructure that might be available in the Tucson marketplace. Um, you know, just getting back to a typical uh, lease space, you know, in the small business. Uh, you know, lease space, if you lease 1,000 to 2,000 square feet that might be half office or 20% office, the rest warehouse, you know, lease rates run between 450 to about $1,100 a month. That's a typical cost. Uh, it was 35% higher three years ago, three, four years ago. It's come down that much. You usually get a month or two of free rent. So that's what happens in this kind of market. Rents have come down. You get that kind of uh, concession. What, what size is that for? 1,000 to 2,000 square feet. So what kind of contract would you expect to get into something like that? What like, term, well, like what period of time? Yeah, well, I mean, what would you be locked in for? For I mean, if, say you're a small business owner, you're looking for... You know, you, could, you literally can do month-to-month -month leases now. Okay. I mean, their preference is a minimum a year. But we represent the largest owner of business park, incubator, business park type property, the, you know, smaller spaces, and he does month-to-month -month leases. Well, what about for some sort of, uh, like a small retail space? You know, I'm saying small being 1,500 square foot, maybe 2,000 square foot. What are the in rents? Pardon? What are the rents? The rents are the term, the lease term. The term? Yeah, uh -huh. yeah, the term. Um, I mean, so say, say uh, Ina and Thornydale, somewhere in that area over by the other bookmans, you know, in one of those... Generally, I'm going to say two to three years. Okay. You know, you may have a landlord in a, in a shopping center that's not doing well that says, if you take this space as is, you can have it for six months. 
shopping center owners tend to be more concerned with the tenant mix and some of the synergy of the businesses, there's that word again, <laughs> the businesses um, working together and they may want to be able to tell a larger um, tenant, you know, this is the rent roll, which means who's there and how long they'll be there. So uh -huh. maybe longer term is probably more important in retail than it is in the business part of uh -huh. the space. But, you know, on that token, you could stand still and watch the retail outlets around town close. The retail well, market actually is closer to, um, you know, balance between we'll tell tenants that at and crossroads. Men. Pardon me? Crossroads at uh, Grant and yep. Swan. Yep. And well, boom, there's another one going down, here's another one going down, here's another one going down. And you watch it over the past year and a half. Sure, I mean, and also at Plaza Palomino, the same thing, you walk through here, it's a bloody ghost town. Where's that? Plaza Palomino. Oh, sure. That's a pretty odd, unique property because it, retail it's, needs visibility. It's terrific, isn't it? It, it is, <laughs> but it's all. You yeah, know, but, it, but it did wonderfully for years. Yeah. For years. Tucson yeah. has a way of a tendency to overbuild, whether it be you know, residential or commercial property. Oh, boy, we're going boom, 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 boom. Get the hammers out, fellas, and start, sure. and, and start mixing stock of it because we're going to build. And then it stabilizes and it sits for a long time. The Mervyns at the corner of Craycroft and uh, Broadway had been empty for what? Ten years? That was really the owner's decision, I think. There were plenty of users who would have taken that corner, but they were really kind of strategically trying to reposition that property, and they could sit on it for a while. Mm -hmm. But, you, you know, the overbuilding comment is a good one. Um, Rob talked about the, you know, the mid-'80s. We were completely overbuilt in that situation. Absolutely. You know, the good news for Tucson in this recession is that we didn't overbuild. Um, certainly office didn't get overbuilt. There was very little new construction, um, so the health of the market wasn't so much related to vacancy as it was to um, activity and the stagnation of businesses not moving um, and the consolidations that he talked about with a lot of the firms consolidating back to Phoenix. But Phoenix, completely overbuilt, so their hold to recover from was significantly larger than ours. You had a question. <coughs> Well, if it comes to mind. Oh, yeah. You tend to talk about like thousand foot spaces as leasable, you know. And as a business owner, it makes sense. But anything fifty thousand above, it's like ownership or nothing. Is that true? No. Uh, there's, I would say, generally <coughs> more space available to lease uh -huh. over fifty thousand than there is to purchase. Mm, okay. Yeah, We're plenty of opportunity in, in both arenas, really. I guess what I was thinking is like if you're on that scale as a business owner, strategically, for whatever reason, you might really want to own that space. Well, <clears throat> you know, I uh, I'll speak about that in a in a second, uh, but you know, on the advantages and disadvantages of leasing and, and owning. And yeah, well, I've already seen a lot of what happens when you get this old warehouse. You know, there's been a few surprises here. Oh yeah, oh yeah. yeah. So. Oh, I would imagine. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, Bookman's bought this, you know, still at a cost that would be half or a third of what it would cost to build it. Mm -hmm. You know, so it would, and the building was built in the mid 80s. So, you know, the building's been up now for 25 years and is selling for a third of what it would cost to construct. Does that relate to construction costs? Or does that relate to complete value? Both. I mean, construction costs haven't changed that much. Some have come down a little bit in this, you know, past recession. But basically, construction costs have tracked with inflation. You know, concrete costs and electrical plumbing and, and everything. But but it's interesting because from the mid '80s till now. The last owner, Bookman's, who bought this maybe 14, 15 months ago, buys it for a third of what it costs to build. There's probably been four or five owners in between the first and, and Bookman's. Mm -hmm. And I bet only one really made some money. Mm -hmm. And Bookman's probably will do well with it, although I don't think they have any intention of selling it. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, on ownership, uh, 
your typical, let's say, 5,000 square foot building today, which again, the value has come down by about 30, 40% over the last three, four years. So it's come down considerably. You buy that building today somewhere between about 225,000 to about 300,000. Uh, you can find it even for less and, and for more, but that's kind of, you know, the average. Uh, and a typical down payment there would be 30 to, four, 30 to about 35,000. If you got like a SBA, Small Business Administration type loan, you can get in for about 30 to 45, 30 to 35,000 on a, you know, about a 5,000 square foot building. But then that gets to uh, the thought, you know, I kind of introduced you a thought on, on leasing and on purchasing. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I think the key decision is the available capital, your available capital. You know, if there's an abundance of capital, and you feel it's a good time to buy and it feels right and if your personality is to own versus lease then you have the capital it's a good time to buy um, some of the disadvantages you know it, your flexibility to grow or even to consolidate once you own a building is restricted uh, you know, if, you, if there's significant growth and you set up your, you know, infrastructure and everything in that building, uh, you have a challenge. You know, at the same time, if you, you know, consolidate, want to move to a different market, business isn't going as well. Um, you, you probably can tell by my general comments, I think for a business, that I think leasing provides more flexibility, um, a better use of capital. I would venture to say that you get a better return on your business uh, than you do on the real estate. It's not always true, uh, obviously, but uh, I think maybe as a company matures and they know, you know, they have, uh, you know, 20, 25,000 square feet or 10,000 square feet with some additional land to grow if they need to. And they want to control their destiny. They don't want rent increases because once that market becomes balanced, as these rents have fallen these last several years, well, it is just a matter of time until those rents go up by 30, 40% again. Uh, but if you own a building, then you control your costs. You know, which is important to you know, every business that you have that control. Uh, now tends to be a better time to buy and a lease. Uh, but if you have the capital, now is a good time to buy just because the values have come down. And there's good buys in the market. But generally businesses aren't doing as well and that's why there's this vacancy. But it is a good time to buy. So those are my kind of broad comments about my world, you know, the industrial real estate and what's going on uh, in the market. Uh, there's always a lot of nuances to uh, any of these, uh, any of the details within that, uh, which I'm, uh, you know, kind of happy to address, but at this point I'll kind of take your questions and It's not really a detailed question specific to a lease or anything. Yeah. It's just thinking about real estate markets. When you look at places like the Elkhorn Mall, there's a lot of anchor stores that popped up around there, but the mall itself is still a dump. Um, if you look at Phoenix, they have the same problem where you have Chris Town Mall, just turned into Spectrum Mall, still garbage inside. You have the same thing with Fiesta Mall and all over town, so Arrowhead Mall. So like, my question mainly is what do you do with a property like that? Something huge and massive that is outdated either because it was built 20 to 40 years ago and no one wants to go there, or perhaps it's the location in town where people just don't venture much. What, what happens to a, have there been other parts of the country where they successfully turned a huge property like that into something usable instead of just a big mess? Darren, uh, you know, 
it's a phenomenon that you see, I, I think especially with mall properties because maybe because of uh, a lot of online, you know, commerce, a lot of e-commerce and, you know, is a mall really somewhere where you want to go anymore and, you know, one time with food courts and, you know, 15, 20 years ago it was kind of a fun place to go. I hated it, but it was, <laughs> <laughs> the kids could run around and, you know, you could feed them and buy them stuff and, you know. It's changing. It, it's not my area of expertise, so I, I can't. Comment a little bit. Yeah. You know, so the buzzword is adaptive reuse, <clears throat> and there are some large properties that they've said, look, there's not a market for this size space or this tenant mix anymore, and if the owner has the capital or an investor has the capital, they completely reposition it. And some of the malls around the country have been repositioned as healthcare centers. A lot of medical uses are going out into communities where, you know, there are, um, you know, clinics that have a primary care and then a few kind of common specialties where instead of everybody having to come to the hospital sites where all the medical office buildings are, they kind of push out more to where the consumers are. Um, and, and there's no question in the retail market that uh, retail retailers and the, the floor plan is going through a real seismic shift where they're having to rethink what the right size for every type of store is. And that impacts malls and it impacts owners. But I think there's still um, a place in the market for malls. It takes a good strategy. And I think that's kind of hampered Elcon in particular. But you've seen, um, you know, you've seen like the general growths that went through a big, they own Tucson Mall and Park Place and went through a national bankruptcy and repositioned and um, now kind of have the capital to, they shed some of the underperforming malls and they're repositioning some of the other ones. You know, at Tucson Mall, they completely redid the big box, um, you know, Macy's Space and some of the other ones um, to be more responsive to what the market needed. Does that answer your question? Yeah, it does. I think it, I don't think the mall concept is dying in itself. It's yeah. just that when you get one that's in an old neighborhood that no one wants to go to, right. everything's still small. And, you know, it's just, you know, it's hard. And I mean, there's, there's, there's some mall owners. You know, I, I saw it, I noticed it was in Phoenix last weekend. I just noticed it was even worse there. Uh huh. But, you know, so it's kind of. You know, What's the big mall in Phoenix that's so old that. Um, I was just reading about the Fiesta Mall. Yeah, yeah, that, that one's one really too, crazy. The Fiesta Mall is. It's not even the worst one. It was crusty 15 years ago. I can't remember the name. But, you know, and the other issue with some of the Elcons of the world is um, neighborhood issues and neighbor issues. I mean, some neighbors want a Walmart, some don't. Um, and that's kind of hampered some of their development efforts there, too. But even like what you said about um, just different uses, I actually did recall last year when I was up there, there's a mall somewhere near uh, the state capitol buildings, just a little bit north of there. Still kind of in the downtown area, but they turned half of it into a um, I think it's United Healthcare call center. Huh. So half, half of it is a massive call center. And Univer like the um, there was a retail center that was built in downtown Phoenix that ended up being occupied by a university, I think. Um, so a lot of the uses do flex. A lot you know, like churches going into industrial buildings. I mean that was a phenomenon for a number of years when there was a lot of vacancy in industrial space. And it was, you know, there's plenty of parking and they were compatible with the other users in the space because most of their clientele came on the weekends. So um, there's some flex in the market. In the computer world, we have what they call machine rooms, which are really expensive per square foot, like data center rooms. Do you recommend converting existing space into machine rooms or do you tell your customers you know, everything's so newfangled and needs to be a certain way. Just build it new. Um, you know, and I say this because I just heard it, uh, or read a little article. There's a 20,000 foot data center that's being built right now here in Tucson. Right, in Volta, right. There is, in Volta is a, uh, a new data center that's coming to the market. They just bought a building. It's about a, uh, what's it? It's a oh, so they're converting. And yeah, they're converting a building, uh, okay. and it's a uh, it's a building that has clean rooms and a lot of infrastructure. They're going to gut that building, mm -hmm. and they're going to put you know, and it's an amazing re you know reuse of of a building uh, 
more of a renovation because they they take the roof off. Okay. You know, they they go in and they really change out that building. And there's a building in Butterfield. I think Symantec is in it off of Columbia, just on the east side of FedEx, and that was about 143,000 square feet. They took the roof off that off of that building and it's filled with uh, storage. The data storage. Don't here, whatever you know, the data storage, yeah. you know. And with not many employees, but with data storage, and uh, I find with clients, they know what their IT needs are. Mm -hmm. You know, it is so rare, especially the more more inclined they are to ask that question, <coughs> they know their answer. Mm -hmm. They know what they need. So um, I rarely am advising okay. at that level. And if I did, I'd have to pull someone in who really really do their stuff and uh, uh, but they know well thank you very uh, much oh yeah, briefly for uh, hopefully um, how how do you go about mark how does black guard go about marketing stuff I mean, you got, you know, somebody says I need to build me and here hand handle it for me and send me the check after you sell it. So now it's in your hands. Uh -huh. Now what's, what's, what steps do you take besides putting the little blue sign in between? Sure. Well, we have studied the market, you know, so we know what the competition is doing in relationship to that building. So we work with the owner on pricing it, you know, reasonably so we are competitive. You know, so going from that point forward, uh, there are a couple of multiple like, listing services through the internet. It's LoopNet and CoStar are the primary services. It's like, uh, residential. Sort of like you know, it's like residential, but they're not as good as residential. The residential system is a very, is an, a very advanced, efficient system. I, I still think that the commercial system is is antiquated. Some. Of the commercial real estate companies are members, some are not. Some agents input information, some give more input, more thorough and detailed input, others don't. It's just not that consistency. It, in the residential system, because my wife was in residential real estate for a long time, and, and I, it's just worlds apart. But So it's into that system. And then we're part of a network of other brokers that do what we do. We broadcast the information, you know, to them. Then typically we go and we think of industries that can use that type of property and we will usually contact those industries to see if they would have any interest and look at them and those buildings. Uh, about 25-30% of the tenant or buyer of any building are within a couple mile radius of that property. So we pretty thoroughly canvas. Uh, ideally it's through email, but sometimes it's through mail and sometimes it's just walking through that door to introduce them to that property. And so those are the main ways that we will market our properties. You know, we have our, you know, company website. All of our listings are accessible through our website and, you know, other brokers know to search there. Or if you're doing a Google search for Tucson industrial space, you know, Pycor will rank fairly highly and you can get to our, our listings also. Those are kind of the direct methods that we use. We have indirect relationships with like residential brokers. When they have a use, we encourage them to call us. Other commercial agents that may not specialize in industrial, we encourage them to call us. Uh, the Economic Development Group, TRIO, uh, we have a very close relationship with them and with the University of Arizona, you know, to assist them with their requirements. So those are some of the indirect ways that we'll... As the Department of Economic Development, I, and, and I don't know if there is such a thing there's there actually there is. There's a state commerce authority, uh, a state commerce authority that handles a lot of the inquiries for the state and then funnels those down to the local economic development organizations. 
and uh, in Tucson it's primarily trio, and then the city and the mayor's office um, are also you know have economic development groups, people. and then the state works with the local organizations. And what kind of incentives does the city or county offer? Uh, they have training grants that they provide companies. They have, um, if you employ a certain workforce at a certain wage, uh, there are available tax credits. Uh, uh, they'll write a check uh, if the company is significant enough and, and meets the employment profile and capital expenditure profile. You know, if they're spending, it's the threshold is kind of $5 million in capital, which is an enormous you know, investment of capital in machinery, equipment, building improvement. Uh, but if you meet those thresholds, the state will write you a check. They have a Generally, the state isn't as competitive in writing checks as many states around the country. The Midwest is kind of famous for, you know, Tennessee, you know, for writing $20 million check for that Toyota plant. You know, that's not going to happen in Arizona. I know I, I was dealing heavily with a, a project that really never reached fruition in Tennessee. And it was one of those things where Lamar Alexander said, well, we can't give you that, but we can give you this. <laughs> and it was a interchange, a highway interchange. Yeah. Which was, you know, multi-millions of dollars. And they couldn't, you know, they couldn't get, it was, a, a tra and, and also a sanitary sewer line. Good right. size. You know, and the, the city extent. here will, will do so those things, help the, you uh, move your project along. Yeah, I was dealing with a guy named Michael Dubois. Dubois is the way he uh, and he was the guy that brought the Saturn plant to Tennessee. You can kind of look at the example of the county being proactive to buy land to protect Raytheon's interests here. You know, that's not, a, not directly an incentive, but it's the municipality I mean, being responsive it. to the workforce that's pretty important to the community. Thank you. Any other questions or all right, thanks. Thank you. Thank you. If you're interested, find us on the web, it's pipor.com and we have a blog we post about weekly, that's one of my babies. Um, <laughs> news and information about um, that's of interest to investors and, and occupiers of real estate here, that's um, blog.pipor.com. And I'll leave, we don't do a ton of paper, but I'll leave some, just some paper handouts. It's a Tucson overview, um, some kind of some stats on the market and top employers, and um, this is something that we update semi-annually. So I'm just going to for you. Thank you. Thanks and otherwise, us. take care, and I wish you all the very, very best. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.